for 60 minutes, if that's okay with everybody. I really apologize if people have to leave at four, um, but as asked in the chat already, the recordings will be put up um, as soon as possible. Um, I expect someone this week, end of this week, um, or next week, and then you can watch the remaining um, question time. So welcome everybody to today's seminar on the limits of neoliberalism and how states respond to the crisis. We've had an overwhelming amount of people interested in hearing today's session, probably due to our star speaker, Kostas Lepovitsas. Welcome. So if our seminar capacity is exhausted, we will try and provide a Facebook live stream and then also make the recording um, available afterwards. Um, my name is Carla Koberger and I've finished my master's degree at SOAS. I'm an active member of the Rethinking Economics um, Society Network and the um, Open Economics Forum. And I currently work as an economist for the research network Rebuilding Macroeconomics at the National Institute for Social and Economic Research. I'm very delighted to have this session today with Kostas. Um, Kostas Lepovitsas, who is a professor of economics at SOAS, um, he's a former member of parliament for sure it's uh, in the Hellenic parliament and remains an activist engaging in the political struggle around the creation of public financial institutions facilitating a green transition and altering the social and political balance in favor of working people do check out his books and especially follow his recent publications on the website of the European Research Network on Social and Economic Policy, the Jacobin, as the link was already um, published or shared here in the chat, and also in the Red Pepper magazine. This workshop series over the past weeks and the following weeks has been organized, co-organized by the Open Economics Forum and the Economics Department at SOAS. And I'm very thankful um, for organizing and putting these events together. Um, the Open Economics Forum is embedded in the Rethinking Economics Network in the UK, in Europe, and all over the world. And um, wherever you are, from wherever you're st uh, streaming in now, check out your local or national Rethinking branch and um, networks. I'm sure they have amazing events on as well. So with this series, we are trying to shed light on current transformation of the economic theory, policy making and the political struggle caused by the coronavirus. And just um, a quick note on today's housekeeping. And um, we, Costas is gonna speak for around 25 minutes now. And I invite everybody to write their question during his talk into the chat. So all the participants are muted so you can't ask questions, but please write them down. And even when you write them down in the next 40 or 20 minutes, um, we'll collect these questions and then we pose them to Costas and get a discussion going after his talk. So on this note, please Costas, let me hand over to you for the next 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Thank you uh, Carla. And, uh, and um, I'm glad to do this. Um, this um, yeah. I'm very sorry about the delay, but I uh, will try and make up for it. Um, now, I want to do a number of things on the coronavirus crisis. I want to um, discuss the substance of it. Um, I want to tell you the what the impact is on developed countries and on um, developing countries. And I want to look at... Uh, some uh, options for policy as it is actually being uh, engaged in at the moment and as it ought to be uh, in uh, my view. Now let's get on with the analysis of the crisis in the first place. It is of course commonplace to say that uh, um, that this is uh, 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 unprecedented. It's an unprecedented crisis and it, indeed it is. Um, it is completely unprecedented because um, um, to a large extent it has come from an external shock, it is global, and of course it has hit a weakening economy. Let me take these things uh, one at a time. The structural thing I, I want to say, which should be familiar to all of you uh, who have studied at SOAS or have been close to SOAS, is that um, the reality of the world economy since 
um, is that mature countries, advanced countries, have been going through a period of, in a sense, stagnant financialization. Financialization has not proceeded um, powerfully since 2009. It's been on a plateau in the metropolitan countries, uh, but it has accelerated in developing countries. The combination of these two um, characteristics of the last 10 years uh, matters greatly for what's happening at the moment, um, given the coronavirus shock. So let me be a little bit more particular about it to exemplify the point. If you look at um, mature countries, United States, um, the European Union, Japan, and so on, and I'll have occasion to say more about them as we move, up, move along, then you can clearly see that growth during the last 10 years has been at its weakest for decades. There's no question that capital uh, accumulation has been um, very weak, very weak indeed. Second point, you can see that um, profitability of productive capital has been um, uh, falling since about 2014 and it has been generally weak anyway. Profitability of um, financial capital, particularly banks, has been nowhere near as, uh, um, as dynamic as it was in the previous decade. Third point on developed countries, productivity growth, which of course is the, um, the driver of uh, capitalist accumulation, has been appalling. Um, it's been the weakest for a very long time. Uh, in the United Kingdom, for instance, it's been weakest than um, for decades, but it's similar to the, similarly weak in the United States uh, and elsewhere. Fourth point, inequality has been uh, as pronounced as ever and has become worse during the last um, uh, 10 years. Now, that is uh, what's been happening in mature countries. Uh, in effect, we haven't had any structural change um, since the great crisis of 2007-2009. What we've had is the state intervening, rescuing um, financialized and neoliberal um, capitalism from the, from the great crisis of 2007-2009, but not changing things structurally and not changing things in any kind of um, um, profound way. The result has been weak accumulation and lack of dynamism in, 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 for finance in mature countries. At the same time, in developing countries, uh, financialization has proceeded apace. The characteristic of the last years, last 10 years has been um, rapid and dynamic financialization in several middle-income countries. Um, and that matters greatly for uh, what's going to happen now that COVID uh, has hit, uh, as I will explain in a minute. Now, this, this complex set of factors can be seen from the perspective of finance, too, if we look at debt. I say that because a lot of breathless stuff is being spoken about when it comes to debt, that this is the biggest volume of debt ever, that debt has been increasing enormously, and so on. Actually, the picture is much more complex than that. If you look at mature countries, if you look at the United States, if you look at other parts of Europe and so on, it's not a picture of advancing debt uh, across the board. Household debt, which was characteristic of the period up to the Great Crisis, has actually declined as a proportion of uh, GDP and declined significantly. Bank-to-bank um, -bank debt, in other words, the, bank, the debt that is created among financial institutions, which is a strong element of neoliberal financialization, um, has also fallen uh, during the last 10 years, reflecting, as I said, the indifferent performance of finance. Enterprise debt, on the other hand, has increased, and that is a source of weakness. And not only uh, has it increased, but some very, very uh, dangerous parts of uh, types of debt have increased uh, among enterprises, non-financial enterprises, and I will discuss these um, in a minute. The real star performer when it comes to debt, however, in mature countries, the last 10 years, has been state debt. It is the state that has been borrowing very strongly to rescue um, the um, financialized neoliberal uh, capitalism 
that led to the great crisis 2007-2009. States are already very heavily indebted and that creates a major complication to how they're going to deal with the current crisis. Now, in developing countries, on the other hand, especially emerging markets or middle-income um, um, countries, the trajectory will be quite different if one puts China into it. Um, the great new volume of debt in the last 10 years has been in China. It's China that's been leading the, uh, the dance, uh, both uh, in terms of its enterprises uh, and more generally. Uh, that is what's, that, what has driven the great increase in global debt. However, in several other middle-income countries, debt has also increased in complex ways, often to do with advancing domestic financialization, and that matters again greatly for developing countries will be hit by uh, coronavirus. It's already um, emerging. Now, summing it all up, I think what we've got is a continuation of um, neoliberal financialized capitalism during the last 10 years on a weaker basis, but spreading across the world and relying increasingly on the state. The state, um, which has made such a powerful appearance the last uh, few months, uh, is not new to um, neoliberal financialized capitalism. It's always been there. And the last 10 years has been very, very powerful, very, very uh, important in ways that I've hinted it. Now, Time is short, so I've got to move faster than that. Uh, let me tell you what the nature of the shock is then, the nature of this crisis, how to, how to approach it. Because as I, said, it's, as I said before, it's unique, unprecedented, and a lot of people are saying that. I think one way to, a good way to approach it is to look at uh, Keynes' analysis of um, uh, how to pay for the war. It's a famous little book that uh, John Maynard Keynes wrote in 1940 discussing how to deal with the um, uh, Second World War, which you could think of as a huge shock. You could think of the war as a shock. And people do talk of coronavirus as a kind of war. So it's not an uh, unreasonable um, analogy. Obviously, it's not a war in the same, in the sense of the Second World War. It's not a firing war. But, but it, uh, you can think of it in those terms. Now, Keynes's argument, we don't have to go into the details of it, was basically structured in terms of what would happen to aggregate demand and aggregate supply. In a war, uh, obviously, you need to increase um, military production, and that means that you've got to direct resources away from peace production towards military production. You've got to organize, reorganize employment directed towards military production, compress peacetime production, and uh, you also have to adjust demand as a result because, of course, you're going to produce fewer goods for, um, for uh, peacetime uh, consumption. So Keynes' problem was of this type. Well, we can think of the coronavirus shock in a similar way. And it is a way that allows us to think of what ought to happen to confront it. Because the coronavirus crisis is, in the first instance, uh, instance a shock to the supply side. Unlike a war, it's actually a shock to the supply side because supply chains um, collapse, are broken up. They're broken up because enterprises stop uh, functioning, so supply freezes up. It's not actually a redirection of supply towards war, of course, towards war uh, needs, but it's a freezing up of supply, and actually it's a reallocation of supply as a result. Sup supply, be, um, supply resources will have to be reallocated. How? It depends also on what happens to demand, because demand also receives a shock. Um, in the case of um, uh, coronavirus, and it has received a shock because people have been put on furlough in, in, in the UK or stopped working, their incomes uh, have declined, unemployment has increased, supply has contracted, and that has actually impacted on demand. Uh, demand has contracted and that has actually impacted on supply uh, again. So you have a combination of uh, frozen and reallocated supply and uh, contracting demand. It's a unique shock um, that you get, which leads to a huge recession. In the case of developing countries, things look a little different because the shock of the virus um, has not been as great as for um, developed countries by and large, but they will suffer the impact of, of trade. As the supply chains have been uh, um, disarticulated and trade is uh, uh, contracted, 
the blow to developing countries has been um, very great coming from trade, fundamentally from trade. And to that, you must add more elements, which is not directly connected to coronavirus, but happen together with it, which is, of course, the oil crisis. Uh, the oil collapse, oil price collapse, which um, has uh, hit a number of developing countries very hard, oil producers, but also lessened the burden temporarily for oil importers among developing countries. So it's a complex shock, both on demand and on supply, aggregate demand and supply, which is which is leading to a massive recession, including in developing countries. Uh, the figures that the one sees from the by the IMF and so on are unprecedented. Um, 9% contraction, 10% contraction for key uh, advanced countries. These are phenomenal figures um, that are bandied about. Anyway, I'll come back to that. Not much about the real economy shock. There's also been a financial shock, though, and we've got to look at the financial shock in a little bit more detail. And three elements of it are worth mentioning here of the financial shock. The first is, of course, the um, um, collapse of stock exchange prices and the collapse of financial prices associated with financial markets in general. <clears throat> um, I said originally that financialization um, has been marking time since the great crisis, and that is broadly speaking true, but there's been a localized bubble in the stock market. The financial asset prices increased dramatically the last um, 10 years, mostly because money has become Many money became very cheap, and that led to um, overblown financial prices across a range of markets um, and bonds, and these naturally collapsed, um, as we all know, um, uh, when the when the crisis hit and the, sh the nature of the shock became clear. That's the first point. Second point, and in this sense, more standard for capitalist crisis is that uh, short-term markets, um, liquidity markets also froze. Um, short-term liquidity markets froze because of the typical capitalist crisis, people became very scared uh, at be, uh, holding their, their, their wealth in um, assets and they wanted to hold cash. So you had a generalized move towards cash. You observed that in commercial paper markets and in treasury bill markets, and there a number of games that speculators have been playing for a while became very apparent as well. Uh, arbitrage between short-term markets and uh, spot markets and futures markets. So tightening of the um, of the uh, 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 short-term liquidity markets also took place. The third point I want to stress is what's been happening to developing countries. And there we've had the dramatic reversal of capital flows. That's the third financial impact, dramatic reversal of capital flows. Portfolio flows, uh, basically buying bonds and buying uh, other financial assets in developing countries have collapsed. Um, the reversal of capital flows to developing countries since late January is of the order of 100 billion, according to the IMF. It's unprecedented in size uh, and in uh, uh, rapidity. Um, now, that obviously creates um, massive problems for developing countries and also puts financialization in developing countries uh, in its proper light. And I want to say a couple of words about that. Those of you who are associated with SERS, who studied the SERS, will, will recognize immediately what we're talking about, but the others will also see the point uh, also, uh, very soon. Um, during the last two decades, particularly the last decade, developing countries have financialized and financialized significantly. And that has to do with um, opening up to the global markets, to the international financial markets. <clears throat> During the last 10 years, this has taken a very strong uh, form in the sense that domestic markets for finance have emerged. There is something called the original sin uh, in for, financial, for, for, for developing countries taking part in um, global financial markets. And that means um, they, that their inability to borrow in their own currency, if you're Indian, you cannot borrow in rupees, if you're South African, you cannot borrow in rand and so on. The, the inability to borrow in, in your own currency uh, opens you up and exposes you to risk because you're borrowing in dollars uh, in, in the global markets. And that has been an element of the weakness of these um, 
um, subordinate uh, capitalist countries historically. And that has been a dimension of early financialization. During the last 10 years, we've witnessed a kind of reversal of that. As these middle income countries financialized and large markets emerged, domestic markets emerged in South Africa um, and in, uh, in Turkey and in other countries, domestic capitalists were able to borrow by issuing financial assets in their own currency and, borrow, and foreigners would buy them. So we had uh, capital flows coming in from abroad, buying developing country assets denominated in the developing country currency. It is precisely these that have, um, um, have, have become, have, have become uh, reversed now. It, it is these assets um, that, um, uh, that have reversed, uh, these flows that have re reversed right now. And it is very interesting to observe. It shows that the subordinate position of middle income countries, their exposure to the global markets has not actually been dealt with by the advancing financialization of the last 10 years. Their weakness has not gone away. The original has not gone away. What has actually happened is that by allowing foreigners to um, lend to them in their own domestic currency, in rupees, in rand, and in whatever else um, um, it is, foreigners took on the risk themselves. Uh, and as soon as the crisis hit, uh, the coronavirus hit, crisis hit, then foreigners stopped lending because it still is very risky to lend to Indians in rupees if the rupee is going to fall. It still is very risky to lend to South Africans in rand if the rand is going to fall. So capital reversed. Capital then flew back um, and, 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 and emerging markets at the moment, developing countries at the moment, find themselves in an incredible position. It's the perfect storm. Um, uh, trade is collapsing. Uh, the shock of the, of the virus domestically um, is unknown, but substantial and financially, uh, they're confronted with a perfect stock, the perfect um, uh, uh, shock. Now, what to do and how to deal with it? <laughs> We've got to start with what the state is doing. The state is fundamental to financialization, it's fundamental to neoliberalism, has always been. Um, the state has taken a number of um, uh, steps in dealing with this already. It's done so in developed countries and it's beginning to do it in developing countries too, although the options in developing countries are far fewer. Uh, what he has done in developed countries is, of course, in the first instance, to support enterprises, support capital. I say this because a lot of people get confused. They think that uh, um, the state might actually go against neoliberalism now, and neoliber neoliberalism might collapse of its own accord. It will not. It will do nothing of the sort. It will just reorganize the way it works. The state then has provided significant support to enterprises, and we've seen it in terms of um, loans, uh, tax deferrals. Um, social security payment deferrals, uh, and so on. Interestingly enough, the state has also provided support for employment, support for uh, wage labor, because it has appreciated that uh, unemployment could become uh, phenomenal. So um, the support for uh, employment is unprecedented, it has to be said. Effectively, the state has nationalized the wage bill of large private capitalists um, in, a, in, in a number of countries. Nothing like that has happened before. You can see it very clearly in the UK with the, with the practice of furlough, but you can see it um, uh, elsewhere too. One point I want to stress here, and perhaps we can discuss it in, uh, in questions subsequently, is that I'm generalizing about the state. However, there are also major differences between how the state has done this in the USA, in China, in Europe, and elsewhere. It's not the same. Intervention you see, but it's not the same. Each state intervenes in their own country depending on circumstances, on political arrangements, and on the domestic political economy. That hasn't gone away. So the Chinese state has intervened quite differently from the US state, and we can bring that up in a question and answer session. Nonetheless, states have intervened across the board. States have also intervened in finance, of course, and that has been uh, another crucial 
um, crucial part of um, intervention. Um, and they've intervened in finance in three ways, all of which are fundamental to neoliberal financialized capitalism and show the continuity of it. First, states have brought interest rates down to zero. This continues to be zero interest rate capitalism. It's an unprecedented period in the history of capitalism with interest rates being driven down to zero. Um, that has gone together with the abundant provision of liquidity um, to financial institutions in the first place, to the economy generally. What allows the state to do that today is, um, is um, its command over money. Uh, the role of the state in contemporary capitalism is uh, particularly crucial because, of course, it commands money. It commands the main, me the creation of the main means of payment. The state has never given that away, and that shows how shows you how neoliberal financialized capitalism works because there is no competition in the issuing of money. There's absolute fiat, absolute monopoly. The state has that monopoly, and that gives it tremendous power and it can drive interest rates down to zero, and it can provide liquidity as and when it is necessary by capital and for capital. And he has done that, again, in this crisis, indicating that very little has changed in terms of how it um, uh, relates to crisis. The third thing that the state... The third thing that state... Three minutes. Uh, ...has to do with the international interventions. Uh, as developing countries found themselves under pressure, for reasons that I've explained, um, particular middle-income countries faced with the capital outflows were at the, were at the point of a major crisis. That appeared in the form of dollar shortage. It became very clear that um, key key countries in the in, in the developing world were faced with a dollar shortage. That is something we've seen before in previous crises. We saw it in this one too. And the answer to it was very similar to that in of previous crises too. It took the form of uh, dollar swaps. The uh, Federal Reserve intervened and eased the crisis by allowing these middle-income countries to access uh dollars indicating that in this respect too very little has changed the the, the global uh, answer to the immediate financial crisis has been as before the federal reserve providing liquidity the federal reserve resolving the crisis through the dollar in other words reasserting the global power of the dollar the the, the role of the dollar as uh world money so the state has been crucial to dealing with the crisis so far and I think it will be crucial to, crucial to dealing with the crisis in the time to come, because of course the time to come will be very difficult. The crisis has only just begun. It's only just begun. Um, there will be a recession, as I've already indicated, for reasons that I've explained. There will be a, a recession. The recession will be severe. It will happen in the developed countries and it will hit the developing countries too. Um, the main points of weakness for recession, uh, for this recession to emerge, are of course the non-financial enterprises, which are very heavily indebted, several of them, and that's a point of weakness, demand and supply uh, are in trouble. The banks, which are always uh, um, weak when the real economy goes into weakness, they are not initially weak. This is not a problem that started with banks, but banks will bear the burden of it as things unfold. Households in developing countries are likely to prove um, uh, weak to the, to the unfolding recession because they've got a lot of debt. And crucially, in the last point, the state, which is already heavily indebted, will find the recession very difficult uh, as it confronts the pressures of it, particularly in, in Europe. So the points of weakness are not the same. Enterprises in the United States mostly and in other parts of countries. Banks in the United States and other parts of developed countries uh, possibly. Households and banks in developing countries, state in developed countries uh, will be key areas uh, uh, of weakness as the recession unfolds uh, and it assumes um, great magnitude as in all probability will do.
what to do then i want to finish with that what to do um in some ways it's obvious it's obvious and uh, states are already doing it um the crucial point the crucial point to stress here is that um the intervention hinges, hinges on the state but it must not only hinge on the state on the central state because if it does hinge on that then what we're going to get is uh, reaffirmed neoliberalism and reaffirmed financialization and that would possibly be even worse than before because um, what we witnessed the last um, few weeks and previously has been uh, an exercise in um, uh, in, in, in state imposed authoritarianism and states don't forget that so there are issues of democracy as well as uh, economic uh, 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 recovery that must not be left to the um, central state uh, we must have independent action and independent activity in this by communities by association organizations by uh, as it were forms of organizing from below in order to create a, a different economy uh, as, as 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 we're dealing with uh, with the shock now in terms of what needs to be done it's clear demand must be supported in the first place demand is contracting must be supported that means supporting people's income and protecting employment in the first instance that is paramount in this context i would argue strongly for reconsidering uh, the role of uh, universal basic income. Uh, I've always been very skeptical about universal basic income, very critical of it as an idea, for a variety of reasons which we don't have to rehearse right now. Um, but given the magnitude of the shock, and given the, co the compression of demand, and given what's been happening in Europe and elsewhere, in the United States, millions of people have gone onto the uh, unemployment lists in the last few weeks. Um, the time has come to consider the idea of uh, universal basic income seriously as an anti-corona uh, virus uh, measure. Uh, it would be uh, a cheaper and uh, uh, more a fair way of supporting demand, supporting people's income and protecting employment. It will give the breathing, some breathing space while uh, while the, the, the worst of the crisis is upon us, and it will give societies options to consider how they're going to reorganize employment and labor subsequently. Point number two, in terms of what should happen, is of course intervention in supply, in the sphere of supply. It isn't just demand, supply must be supported. Um, supply uh, here means basically um, supporting the, recreating the disarticulated supply chains um, and that means supporting key areas of production and key areas of um, the sphere of circulation but not simply by giving private capital breathing space um, supporting these key areas by intervening uh, and demanding public management and public ownership rescuing virgin uh, airlines is not really uh, something that should happen automatically. Uh, protecting big business is not something that should happen automatically. Something has to be given in exchange, and that means public management, the public ownership uh, of key resources. Um, associated with that is, of course, a change in the rules and practices of state aid. State aid needs to be uh, used far more creatively and actively, and this holds particularly for Europe, where state aid regulations um, have been throttling uh, the performance of the uh, European productive sector for a long time. These have been lifted, they have to be used actively, and they have to be used actively uh, by local communities. That is one key way in which local communities begin to intervene in reorganizing the um, supply side to rebalance the economy. Still in the same area, we need evidently a massive program of public investment on the supply side. Europe, in particular, needs a massive program of public investment. So does the United States. The infrastructure of both Europe and the United States is falling behind, and their ability to intervene in the new technologies is uh, appalling. So public investment is also necessary here. In other words, the intervention in the sphere of supply uh, must change the balance between the private and the public in favor of public um, uh, in the time ahead. Last thing here is, of course, 
transform the financial markets. I've said a lot about developing countries. I've said a lot about the short to emerging markets, um, the, the, the current sudden stop uh, unfolding in front of us and the perfect storm facing middle income countries. That is yet more evidence of the continuing reliance of um, dependence of uh, developing countries on the global financial system, which works against them. Time and again, time and again. I mean, you, 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 developing countries have to rely on global capital flows. The end result is that they face a crisis. And it takes a different form every time. But here we are, uh, yet again, something has to happen at long last about the uh, global financial system, something to protect systematically um, uh, uh, developing countries. And that something is clear. It's not as if we don't know what it is. There have to be capital controls. Uh, and there has to be a system of uh, stabilizing exchange rates, preferably within um, a flexible band uh, to, to give uh, domestic policy some um, uh, flexibility. The point I want to finish is, is this. Now, how to pay for all this? Move back to Keynes and then how to pay for the war. I want to finish with that. How to pay for all this? Um, it is clear that the state will have to borrow. State borrowing will increase. It's not. It's just impossible to deal with it otherwise uh, at the moment. State borrowing will increase, but the borrowing that the state um, will make, if it the policies that I've outlined, is essentially a down payment of future returns. It's not as if the state is borrowing to fight a war. The state is borrowing to get the machine going, the productive engine going, and, and to transform it. So it is. It is borrowing that could pay for itself. Um, there are plenty of ways in which this can happen, uh, and it is inevitable. That must be accompanied by a transformation of the tax regime, and the tax system, uh, whereby, uh, at long last, uh, those who are wealthy and those who got highest incomes should make a contribution to um, what society uh, needs to pay. There should be a change of tax um, with a significant increase of tax incidence on um, the rich and the wealthiest uh, uh, in the country. There should be a rebalancing of it, um, of, 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 of taxation and therefore uh, intervention in, um, in the sphere of inequality. These are the bare minimum at the moment. No doubt a lot more will happen as we move along. It's a moving target. Um, no doubt we will discuss it again. But this is how it seems to me uh, in these early days. Uh, these are what we, the tasks, tasks that we've got in front of us. The more we discuss them from the perspective of the alternative economics, the better for all of us. Thank you. Wonderful. So now we have roughly 20 minutes left for questions. And there have been many. So thank you so much for the brilliant questions coming in. Um, Costa. So I think we have um, we have a lot of questions coming in specifically for emerging markets and also obviously about the EU. But I would like to start with a more conceptual question of, um, you know, I mean, your piece in the Jacobean magazine and also your talk now started very much with the idea that the nation state has already or has always been kind of incremental to um, even an, like an, a neoliberal financialized capitalism. And um, then you went on to say how the shock is a demand and a supply shock and also a financial shock. And I think like one question that um, that was raised in the comments, but that I'm also really intrigued by is how exactly do we conceptually understand the connection between the financial markets at the moment and the development in the real economy, hence demand and supply, given the fact that the financial markets, at least like their surprises, neither in the ducks nor the, um, the FTSE, no the SNA um, index, have really dropped significantly, right? So like, most of the um, um, stock markets are either not decreasing as much or recovering over the past four weeks. So what do we see here? Do we see a financial market and financial traders who just don't see a great recession coming? Or do, we, do they think that the supply chains are going to be restored in the next three or four months and it's just going on like usual? What exactly is the dynamic happening here? I want to make two points on that. 
first of all, this is a very different crisis to the crisis of 2007, 2009. And I say this because a lot of people thought that we would see a, a repeat or that this is a crisis that has to do with the um, overexpansion of finance in the previous period and then the collapse of it. It's not, that's not it. That's not what's happening, right? That's not what we're living through. Um, although there's no doubt that the stock markets in a number of countries had become overblown uh, and therefore it fell dramatically for, for, for a few weeks. Uh, that's not where the, the roots of the crisis lie. That's the first point I want to make. And it's important to understand because finance had not been having a party in the previous uh, 10 years, unlike the previous crisis. As for the recovery of the financial markets, which is uh, clear, as you point out, they are actually, they've become more stable the last uh, two, three weeks. The reason is clear. Money is free. Money has become free again. Money has become free. Uh, they are awash with liquidity. Uh, once again, the state has effectively issued uh, an implicit guarantee um, to these institutions. And that has uh, stabilized prices because what would you do with it? The money doesn't cost. You would buy financial assets. That's basically what's happening. There is no, I can't see anything else uh, deeper than that. Um, and you could even see it in, in terms of who they're lending money to and on what terms. It isn't simply bonds and uh, shares and so on that they're buying. When you look at sovereign debt, which is another large market for, for finance, when you look at sovereign debt, even countries like Greece, the last little while have been able to borrow on very low interest rates. Do people think that Greece will grow rapidly? If they believe that, they're idiots. I don't believe that they do believe that particularly. What's happening is that money money has become abundant, free, and that uh, that stabilizes markets. Now, is this a way to run capitalism? It isn't, but that's what financialization is all about. That's, that's what we mean by a kind of... Uh, very peculiar uh, social and economic arrangement that surrounds us and will not go away by itself. The state does what the state has always done in these crises. It provides liquidity, drives the rates of interest down, rate of interest down and stabilizes financial markets. It's not going to come from that. It's not going to change uh, dramatically from that uh, side. I can't hear you. Still. No, yeah, wonderful. Um, great. So now let me pose um, some questions on emerging markets. So there have been some on on financing, but let's start with the supply chains. So there have been two questions regarding supply chain and the resulting change of the global manufacturing structure. One is, um, do you think that? Um, Will the joint supply and demand shock in developed countries correlated with the relative rapid recovery in the Chinese economy entail a shift to closer trade and investment relations between countries of the global south? And the second one would be, um, given the fact that a lot of um, developed countries kind of um, pose a very strong emphasis on uh, reassuring, like bringing back industries of, of key production or sectors, is that going to change global um, production and supply chains? Um, first of all, I, I would, I would join caution when it comes to China. People are too willing and too ready to believe that China is coming back and coming back rapidly and uh, and it's bouncing back. That's not what the evidence shows. The Chinese economy um, will go through very slow growth in the coming period, and it will face uh, sustained problems, many of which will have to do with uh, its international position and its ability to export. The export market of China will, um, will contract uh, in all probability as we move along and that will impact the domestic economy so china will not come back in the same way as before plus china has got a tremendous problem of debt uh, which has to be dealt with of course china has got other uh, strengths which have to do with state operated enterprises and the role of the state operating differently but the weakness must not be underestimated now 
Will the supply chains across the world uh, be altered as a result of this? It is very difficult to tell. I think more important than coronavirus here is, will be the um, what, what what's happening to oil prices. The collapse of oil prices um, will transform the allocation of resources and productive capacity across the world in ways which were unprecedented before. A lot of oil producers in the United States will be driven out of business. Uh, a lot of um, several oil producing developing countries will find will have great difficulties already Iran is uh, on the door of the IMF um, so that will affect production and costs across uh, the developing world now will it change the internationalization of production which is basically what you're asking me will it change the way international enterprises um, have operated the last 20 30 years by itself i don't think so i don't think they will do that um i don't think that without a change of policy at the top a, a change of um uh, institutional and um, uh, policy measures at the top it will happen uh, automatically i don't believe that it will do so um i think that um, um Everything points to a continuation of what we've got so far, but weaker. Um, so we shall see. Thank you. Um, given the fact that you talked about global balance of power, Manar posed a question which was exactly on that, how global power or how the global balance of power would change. I hope your um, question was answered. If not, please uh, send us another um, more in-depth question. If you have more. Okay, let's move on to um, financing in, in emerging markets. And we've got a couple of really good questions here. One um, is the obligation, like what obligation does the international community has? Um, the turn, I mean, the, the, the increasing negative growth rates and defaults in emerging countries. Maybe you can comment there um, on the recent reports from the IMF and the, um, the supportive uh, kind of financing schemes that they've just put out for a couple of sub-Saharan African countries. The second one would be, um, is there a need, uh, no, uh, does... I can't hear you, Carla. I can't hear you, Carla. Sorry, hello? Sorry, can you hear me? You went, you, you went mute for a bit. Okay, sorry. So the, the first one is on um, the IMF and what, what's the need or what's the obligation of the international community. The second one is, um, is there the need for debt jubilee for developing nations in order to enable these countries to spend more on healthcare and fiscal stimulus to deal with the, with the, with like with the economic crisis? And um, I think the last one um, is also interesting on, no, there are two more. One on how do we deal with countries who are subject to um, embargoes? So, for example, the IMF denied a five billion loan to Venezuela, but maybe like the, the question also applies to Iran. And the last one is on um, the dollar swap lines by the Fed. And, um, you know, while there was a great intervention to a lot of countries, Brazil was the only one um, receiving swap lines who, who was not a high income country. And do you think these swap lines should be extended to other countries? Okay, <laughs> I need at least an hour to deal with all that, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, uh, broadly what I believe ought to be happening. The way, the system, the way it stands at the moment is dysfunctional for reasons that we've discussed. And we're, we're witnessing the dysfunctionality uh, very evidently, again, in terms of the uh, reversal of capital flows that we're observing, collapse of portfolio flows. If that's not evidence of dysfunctionality, I don't know what is. 100 billion um, contraction since uh, late January, in two months. Now, um, the system is dysfunctional. Logic says that a new system must be put in place, which is more functional to, for the needs of developing countries. But we've known this for three decades. Every time there's a global crisis, the same thing comes up. The international financial architecture doesn't work. We need to do something about it. We need to intervene. On this occasion, what does logic say? Logic says the IMF 
should issue SDRs. It should issue SDRs abundantly, and the needs of developing countries should be, the liquidity needs should be met through SDRs. Logic says that there should be uh, indeed a debt moratorium, a debt jubilee, call it what you like, and a, de and a debt restructuring for uh, poor countries. Logic says that uh, middle-income countries should be given help to deal with problems of um, original sin that I mentioned before, the reversal of original, uh, um, original sin redux, uh, which, I, which I mentioned previously. Logic says that too. Logic also says that there should be controls over capital flows, because when you take a very theoretical position on this, what benefit do free capital flows offer to these countries if you get a crisis every 10 years? Um, will it happen? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't see why it should happen now if it didn't happen in 2007, 2009, if it didn't happen after the Asian crisis. And all the evidence that we've seen so far points to an absence of this. The resolution of the liquidity problem for middle-income countries so far has been through dollar swap. In other words, a, a, a decisive uh, intervention by the United States to defend the role of the dollar as the key currency uh, across the world. What more evidence does one want? Um, will there be a system of uh, capital control? I don't think so. Um, I, 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 I doubt severely that there will be any of these changes. I think that what is going to happen will be the usual make it up as you go along, patch it up here, fix it there, and hope for the best. The difference this time is that, of course, middle income countries will come to realize that domestic financialization, the way they the way they underwent it the last 10 years is no solution to their answers. So they will probably have to rebuild uh, their reserves. I suspect that they will be rebuild their reserves, um, uh, which they allowed to decline the last 10 years. Uh, I suspect they will rebuild them, uh, and that will mean more costs, more costs for developing countries. That's basically a cost on, 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 on growth and a cost, a cost on development. They will be forced to keep large amounts of money um, uh, basically idle, um, or even financing the United States uh, in the coming period. In other words, I'm not optimistic uh, about uh, a rebalancing of, um, of developing, uh, development finance in the coming period. Okay, thank you. So we have um, 10 minutes left. Let's turn to the EU, maybe um, keep your comments brief. Um, well, there are a couple of existential questions about the EU. Um, one saying, it seems that the EU is once again struggling to come up with a unified response to the crisis. Will there be a sovereign debt crisis similar to the great financial crisis, or do you believe that the ECB will take more proactive role in the crisis management? That kind of um, goes together with, um, is it time for the EU to finish off with a single currency? Um, yeah, maybe do those two. Um, quickly, and then we turn to more specific European um, policies. Let me start with the single currency. The single currency, my favorite topic of the last few years, but the single currency is, I mean, if, if anyone needed more proof that the single currency offers nothing to Europe, this is it. I mean, here we are, here we are in the midst of another crisis, and the talk by commentators and others is how to save the Europe. It, it is as if I mean, Europe has created an institution such that every time a crisis happens, it must be preoccupied with saving that institution. Why? I mean, what does it offer to Europe? I mean, what exactly is the benefit to Europe from this thing, um, which needs reorganizing our economic policies in order to save it? It was supposed to provide Europe with strength. It was supposed to facilitate convergence, and it was supposed to make European economies stronger. It appears that it makes them weaker because they have to intervene at every difficult turn to save it. So that much about the euro, I don't think the euro offers anything to Europe, and it is actually a hindrance. It is a hindrance to dealing with the crisis because obviously um, its regulations would have precluded and stopped a number of member states from taking the action they need. And if you look at what has happened, the first action by a number of um, European institutions, European Union institutions, has been to lift 
the constraints that the euro imposes. Um, the first one is to lift the stability and growth pact. It's it's not functional anymore. Countries are not under the stability and growth pact. And um, uh, the second thing that they did was to lift the state aid regulations. In other words, the euro works without the central institutional framework. You make it up as you go along. What kind of currency this is, you tell me. So that much about the euro, which is manifestly a failure and is manifestly hampering activity and hampering uh, action, the action of the state instead of facilitating it and promoting growth and convergence in Europe. Let's come to the ECB now, which is by far the most important institution here. The ECB quite clearly doesn't function like a normal central bank, but we've known that for a long time. Um, it's not functioning like a normal central bank because it was not set up like a normal central bank. And yet its interventions themselves indicate how the euro has become more lax. Um, the ECB threw a bit of a wobble to start with, but actually intervened and intervened and made good and decided what? It made nearly one trillion dollars, about 850 billion euros altogether available as liquidity. By doing that, it has basically rescued the euro. That's what, that's what the action was. It rescued the euro and uh, it rescued the big banks of France and uh, Germany that were exposed um, to cross-border lending. Um, the ECB then has intervened to rescue the euro, but its intervention is not comparable to that of the Federal Reserve. All it's done is to ensure that the thing will continue without uh, a collapse. The last thing I want to say on this is the actions of the Eurogroup, not the ECB itself, but the Eurogroup, the governments themselves, because that is also uh, telling in terms of how the European Union works. If you compare to the actions of the Commission or the Eurogroup um, to uh, those of the US government, the British government, which is not in the European Union anymore, uh, or even in the individual member states of the European Union, such as the German government, um, if you compare their actions to those of the nation states, there's just no comparison. Um, the German state has done uh, a lot to support its uh, domestic capital and to, to support the domestic economy within the confines that are, or, or, or the framework that I mentioned previously. And it's much, much more than uh, the European Union itself has done, uh, indicating the point that I uh, that you mentioned uh, earlier, it is the nation state that is dictating the terms. It is the nation state that is dictating the terms of confronting the crisis, not the European Union, not, not the institutions uh, of the European Union. Their own intervention has been small, weak, decisive, moth eaten, really. Um, and uh, that's how it's likely to continue. Um, one last point on this politically. What's most remarkable in this is that countries like Italy or like Greece or like Spain, which rely on, um, which have been hit hard by the coronavirus crisis and could have appreciated some kind of central EU help, and they're not receiving it, certainly not receiving it on terms that uh, are truly helpful. Um, are reluctant again to make the obvious point uh, that this is not in our interests, uh, that this is not helping us, with the possible exception of Italy. So watch this space when it comes to Italy. Maybe the political um, the political repercussions of this weakness of EU reaction will begin to appear in Italy, and then we will see other phenomena emerging uh, in the near term. Okay, um, I have a last blog of questions regarding the UK itself, which, for which you have two minutes to answer. Um, so I think it, it kind of goes back to, you know, the, the imposed that will kind of or might come out of this crisis. 
Could you um, talk a little bit about the implications of nationalizing the wage bill for the capitalist um, you know, structure that we see in the UK and also um, further than just nationalizing wage bills, what are the long-term economic recovery um, strategies that we might see or that we might want to push for? Two minutes. <laughs> Um, the UK government has taken um, some very important um, steps uh, with regard to wages and uh, with regard to uh, supporting enterprises uh, more generally. Um, it won't necessarily uh, act to change the balance between capital and labour in the interests of labour. That's not what, that's not what's going to happen uh, uh, if you leave it to the government. Uh, what it has done is it's been forced upon it in order to forestall a gigantic crisis. That's basically what they've done. Um, I think it is incumbent on UK um, political parties and uh, grassroots organizations and communities to push the government now because it's opened the door. The fact that it's nationalized, that he has nationalized the world, the fact that he has actually intervened in the, in the profit and loss accounts of enterprises dramatically opens the door and uh, allows us to argue for the necessary steps that must happen uh, in order to restructure the UK economy in the way that it obviously needs restructuring. We need a, a massive program of public investment right now. It, that's perfectly obvious. We need a system, I would argue again, of uh, universal income to support the poor and to support those whose employment will become very precarious and very unstable uh, in the period to come. We need um, public ownership and public um, uh, management of the key areas of the economy, including transport uh, and so on, which are apparent if you live in this country. We need intervention in housing uh, on, on a public basis and confronting it. We need also to use state aid um, facilities, uh, such as Preston has done for, for a long time and other local authorities have done in creative ways to support and strengthen local communities. Um, the, 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 the floodgates have been opened. Right? We need to push for that. Um, all that is there and it can be taken advantage of. All these options are available to us and they will uh, restrict and limit neoliberalism and financialization. Nothing will happen by itself. If you, if you, if you expect the government to do it, you will be sadly disappointed. The government will support big business will provide money where it needs to, it will tax people when it has to, uh, and it will try and maintain the, the, the structures of power and economic benefit um, the way they are, uh, as they've always done. Um, so nothing, nothing like that will happen automatically. What needs to happen is obvious. Um, let's have a debate about the coming period. Great, yeah. Let's have another discussion on um, the, the community organizing and pushes that we have to do. Um, before I will pose the last question to you and give you the chance to wrap up in two sentences, I would like to thank everybody for staying in longer over time. I'm, time. I'm really sorry for the delay in the beginning and I'm really sorry that people had to um, drop out during the session. I also want to highlight that next week on the 4th of May we will have another um, event with the title Will Coronavirus Mean the End of Austerity? The Macroeconomics of the COVID-19 Crisis with um, Joe Mitchell and Raza Raymond from SOAS and um, UWE Bristol. So tune in again. So Costas, you will have two sentences um, to wrap up the session for you. And the last question is, when can we go to the pub again? <laughs> um, I don't particularly want to <laughs> wrap up the, um, uh, this, the, the, the session with any big statements. I think much of what happens will depend on how obviously the virus um, uh, behaves much will depend on public health. Public health is the primary thing here. We must make sure that there is no second uh, uh, wave of this thing. Uh, so going to the pub might have to wait a little bit. Um, uh, but under all, in all circumstances, what we've got to bear in mind that this is an unprecedented crisis with profound economic, social, and political implications. And when we do go back to the pub. We should be discussing precisely this and what action we should be taking in order to change these things. Thank you so much. Stay safe, stay safe everybody, and see you next week.
Bye-bye now. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>